section 2.3, calculating limits using limit laws. All right, sometimes limits are more difficult to find, in which case you have to have some little trick. Um, and again, you've seen some of these already in pre-calc, so um, you know, some are a little harder than others. So. so calculating limits using the limit laws. Um, so what I'm going to do is just kind of give you some different limits and then we'll go through a bunch of problems kind of using the different limits. So it says, suppose C is a constant and the limits, the limit as X approaches A of F of X and the limit as X approaches uh, A of G of X exist. All right, so they have that kind of prefacing. If all of that happens, then we could use these limit laws. Okay, then... The limit as x approaches a of both of the functions being added together can be found by finding each individual limit and then adding them together. Though many times we don't necessarily write it out this way, that's pretty much what you're doing. You're taking each individual term and finding the limit. If you have subtraction between them, you would still subtract them. So it's kind of almost common sense. A lot of these limit laws are. If you have a number out front, a coefficient, you could pull it all the way out front, find the limit of this piece here, and then from there just multiply that number by it. So remember, C is just a constant. Don't let a number, a coefficient, get in your way of any of these. If you have the two functions here being multiplied, Still, same thing. You can find the limit of each one individually and then multiply the result. And then if you have division, same thing. You can find the limit of the top, you can find the limit of the bottom. Now this one here, because you cannot divide by zero, it has this extra piece on the end saying, but if the limit equals zero, well, then you can't, you know, use that method. You'd have to use something else. And that's a problem that comes up on several of the problems we have today. That if you would plug the value of A into this and find the limit, it's going to come out to zero. Okay, and that's where, of course, there's like five different kinds you could have this. So then you have to like know all the different ins and outs of each of those. So pretty self-explanatory on those. Like I said, it kind of seems like common sense. You can add, you can subtract, you can multiply, you can divide. Or you can have this thing that we call a multiple where you have a number multiplied out front. You just leave it out front um, and then deal with it in a little bit. Calculating limits using limit laws. So these are the names of each of these. So remember, sometimes we look at things like in math jargon with little rules like that. And then sometimes I might use, you know, the words, you know, use the difference law, use the sum law. And so that's what these are stated verbally as. That first one with addition is called the sum law. Again, kind of common sense, right? The second one is the difference law. The third one is called the constant multiple law. Though I will tell you that the AP book calls it the multiples law. So very similar. <laughs> and then you have the product law and the quotient law. So you already know what sum, difference, product, and quotient mean. You know what addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division mean. So, you know, it's not that those would be too difficult. So it's not like they came up with some kind of you know, wording verbally for them that meant something else. So at the bottom here I have, for instance, if f of x is close to l, which was our limit we talked about on Thursday, and g of x is close to m, it is reasonable to calculate that if you're finding the sum of them, then it's close to the sum of the two limits, l plus m. Okay, sometimes that simplifies, sometimes it does not. I have a bunch of examples coming down here. I kind of figured we'd go over the laws and then apply them. All right, this one here is with a picture. So we could have pictures, we could have tables, we could have equations. Um, it says use the limit laws in the graphs of F and G in figure one to evaluate the following limits if they exist. 
So the first thing you want to make sure you understand is that, you know, the blue lines here are the function that we call g, and the red lines are the one that we call the function f. And sometimes f is down below g, sometimes f is above g. You know, you never know, but you have to make sure you become familiar with the picture first. So the first question says, the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x plus 5 times g of x. So using the limit laws here, it would be the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x. You'd find that first. Plus, you see the coefficient? I'm going to move it out front. 5 times the limit as x approaches negative 2 of g of x. So starting with the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x. f of x, remember, is this red graph. Negative 2 is here. What number does it seem to be approaching? Is it 1 or is it 2? 1 is correct. Okay, so there's that part. Plus 5 times. Now we need to go to g. g is the blue graph. As x approaches negative 2, what y value is that approaching? Negative 1. So I have 1 minus 5 or negative 4. Remember, this is not when x is negative 2, what's f of x, it's what number is it approaching. So a common mistake on this one would be for somebody to write 2 instead of 1 right there. So make sure you understand it's the limit. The limit is what both sides are approaching that we had talked about Thursday last week. All right, this next one is the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x times the limit as x approaches 1. 1 of g of x. Well, here's 1. f of x is approaching 2. And g of x is approaching mm, the limit of g of x does not exist right there, does it? So right there, we have to say this one does not exist. If one part of it does not exist, you can't like, multiply it out. Both limits have to exist. And let's go back to this statement right here. Suppose that C is a constant and that these limits exist. If one of them does not exist, you cannot do the problem. Okay, so that's kind of one that could be a little stumper for somebody, you know, on that. All right, next, the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x divided by g of x is the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x divided the by the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x. So 2 is right here. f of x approaches 1.5, right? Take a little guess there. g of x at 2 approaches... Zero. Remember that one rule? You can't divide by zero. So this here does not exist either. So just to kind of show you the places where it doesn't exist, those are good examples for that. It doesn't happen very often, um, like that the one in the middle. Generally, they're going to ask you places where it is, but just to show you that sometimes it doesn't work, okay? So that's one looking at a graph, okay? And again, I have more examples coming. A few more laws, okay? We also have what's known as the power law. The power law is if you have the limit of something and you have a power here, then what you could do is just find the limit of f of x and take it to that power. It's going to keep your numbers a lot smaller earlier on. And um, it notice it says where n is a positive integer. Okay, so that doesn't work for negative <laughs> integers there. Bless you. Then it says in applying these six limit laws that we just got done talking about, we need to use two special limits. Remember what c was? c was a constant, right? So this is the limit as x approaches a of c is equal to c. 
any time you take the limit of a constant, it is just the constant. And let me explain to you why that is. Let's say this was the limit as x approaches a of 2. This right here means the function itself is 2, or y equals 2. Think of the graph of y equals 2. It's a horizontal line. No matter what point you, you choose, if this is a, aren't both sides approaching the number 2? Right? And so that's why the limit of a constant is a constant. Is because when it is a constant, it's a horizontal line, and every single y value is the same on that horizontal line. Okay? So that's one of the limit laws. It's a real easy one if you know it. Now that you understand why it is just a constant, hopefully it'll be an easy one for you to remember. And this next one is the limit as x approaches a of x. It's just going to be a. It's just going to be whatever it is you're plugging in right there. And why is that? Well, again, think of this thing right here. It means f of x equals x, or y equals x. Isn't this the line, y equals x? Every point on that line has the same exact x and y value. So no matter what you plug in for the x, your y value is going to be the same. That's only if it's x to the first power with no other number with it, no exponent with it. It's just y equals x. If we now put f of x equals x, this one here from, from this law, into law 6 and use law 8, we get another useful limit. And that's whenever it's to a power. You plug the a in for x, and then you end up with a to the n power, where n is a positive integer. And then I have there a similar limit holds for the roots. So like a square root, a cube root, a fourth root. You can take and you can just plug that a right into the x, and you end up with your formula there. So remember that a is generally going to be a number. So like if you had a 2 there, you know, it had the cube root of 2 then or something like that. Where n is a positive integer, if n is even, we assume that a is greater than 0 so that we're not taking the square root of a negative number. So just like you can't divide by 0, you can't take the square root of a negative number. That comes up as well. And then we have a root law. But if you do have a root in here that's not working out well, you can move the root to the outside and find the limit of the inside and then take the root of that, where n is a positive integer. And again, if n is even, we assume that it's greater than 0 because you can't take the square root, the fourth root of a, a negative number. You can take the square root or the cube root of a negative number, though. Like the cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. Okay, it just happens to be a negative answer. All right, so now I have a whole bunch of examples. Okay. Here it says evaluate the limit and justify each step by indicating the appropriate limit loss. Okay. So this first one is I'm going to use subtraction and addition and subtraction, right? So I'm using the sum, SWM, I don't know where I am spelling that. It's like half cursive, half print. Sum and um, difference laws. Okay, so this would break up into the limit as x approaches 3 of 5x cubed minus the limit as x approaches 3 of 3x squared plus the limit as x approaches 3 of x minus the limit as x approaches 3 of 6. So some of you right now are like, why is it necessary to use all of that? Because I know a shorter way. Yeah, I know a shorter way too. But the direction said indicating the loss. So if it's asking me to indicate the loss, 
is asking, do I know what the names of the different laws are? Okay, so that's also part of the question. If they don't say that, if they just say evaluate it, you wouldn't have to show every individual step. Okay, but I will tell you, when you are taking college math classes, they expect from you to be able to state laws. Okay. And this is a college level class, and so I have to teach it that way. Next, this one here, the five would come out front. What was that law called? And for me, that's hard because I teach it two different ways in two different classes. But for you guys, it was, uh, what was it called? Do you remember? Constant multiple law, right. Constant multiple law. So I have five limit as x approaches three of x cubed minus three the limit of x squared as x approaches three plus the limit as x approaches three of x minus the limit as x approaches three of six. All right. So then from there, we could, you know, say a few more laws along the way, like this is just the derivative of a constant is a constant, right? So I know that this is negative 6. Um, that, I don't remember the number of the law on that right there. I just use law 7 right there. Okay, it doesn't have a name to it. I just stated what it was, but I just use law 7 on that one. This one here is law 8. You don't have to memorize the numbers of them, okay? Really, the only ones you're going to have to say are the ones that are the sum, difference, product, quotient, you know, those there. So the limit of this one here is 3 because I'm plugging a 3 in for that x. This here is a power law that I'm using. 3 times 3 squared, and this is a power law as well. You won't always have to do all these steps, guys, okay? Only if the directions say that. 5 times 3 cubed. So this is 5 times 27, which is 135. Minus 3 times 9, which is 27, plus 3 minus 6. And so then when I add them, I have, what, 108 plus 3 is 111, and 111 minus 6 is 105. Okay. So if the directions say to state it, you need to state it. If it doesn't, all you have to do is plug the 3 in here, plug the 3 in here, plug the 3 in here. So like, let me show you if it doesn't say this, just as evaluate. All you're going to do is you're going to say 5 times 3 cubed minus 3 times 3 squared plus 3 minus 6. And you're going to do that one. But because it says justify each step, it had to use my limit laws. Do you understand the difference between the directions? This is just evaluate. And that's justify. Okay, the next one we have right here. The limit as t approaches negative 2. Again, on this, what I would be doing is taking the limit as t approaches negative 2 of t to the 4th minus the limit as t approaches negative 2 of 2 over the limit of 2t squared as t approaches negative 2 minus the limit as t approaches negative 2 of 3t uh, plus the limit as t approaches negative 2 of 2. And so what I just did right there is I did something that was known as the quotient rule. I was taking the derivative of the bottom and the top, and I combined that with my difference and sum rules. 
I could pull these numbers for this one here and this one here out front, and that would be known as my constant multiple. If I was giving you a quiz or a test on this, I would not ask you to do this for every problem. I would ask it one time. Okay, because other than that, most of the time in any calculus class, it's going to be the directions of evaluating. Okay, in which case you just plug the negative 2 in and you'd have negative 2 to the 4th minus 2 over 2 times negative 2 squared minus 3 times negative 2 plus 2, which this here is 16 minus 2, so the numerator is 14. This is 4 times 2, or 8, plus 6, plus 2, which is 16. And then, of course, reduce. 2 goes into this one here 7 times, and this one here 8 times. And you get your answer. So, in reality, this is what we do, as long as we understand why we can do it. We can do it that way because of all of these rules that allow us to move things around. Okay? Next one, and here it, it begins, okay? These are the problem children, okay? You go to plug the zero in for the H right here, and there's a problem. If you plug a zero in, you're dividing by zero. You can't divide by zero, okay? If that happens, that means usually there's some algebraic trick to get rid of that H in the denominator. For example, what if I squared this thing? Negative 5 plus h squared means square the first, square the last, multiply them together and double it. Right? Isn't that what we were doing with x plus h squared even? Now also in the numerator we have minus 25. And then we have h in the denominator. So here is me applying some algebra laws to it. I can square something if it says to square it. I can also reduce things. Like I have a positive 25 and a negative 25, don't I? Those go away. I also happen to notice that the two things left in the numerator both have an H. What if I factor the H out? Once I do that, I can see, oh, the H is now gone. So sometimes you have to finesse the problem to get it into something that is workable, that you can actually do. Now plug your zero in. I get negative 10 plus zero, which that's a pretty hard one for today, right? Negative 10. But I can't get it how it is at the beginning. So if it doesn't work, you're dividing by zero in the problem, you've got to ask yourself, can I do anything algebraically to this thing so that it will work? Okay. Questions on that one? Next one. Another problem, child. I go to plug zero into the denominator. I don't have anything to square this time like I did on the last one. But you guys might remember, last year, the year before, you had situations, even back to Algebra 1, not quite like this, but you had situations where you had a square root stuck in your denominator. Do you remember, like, having something like 5 over 1 plus the square root of 2, and you weren't allowed to play the square root of the denominator, right? So what did you have to multiply by on this problem? The conjugate, right? 1 minus rad 2. Well, that's because the square root was in the denominator. You look at this problem and you're like, yeah, I don't think so. The square root's not in the denominator. Well, what you've got to do is get rid of the h that is in the denominator. And that might mean putting a square root in the denominator. So it's like the opposite idea. Like, blows your mind. Now that you remember how to multiply by the conjugate, let's just try it so you can see what happens. Okay. The conjugate is this exact numerator, but
but with a different sign in the middle. So if it's a plus, you're going to use a minus. If it's a minus, you're going to use a plus. So this is the square root of 9 plus h plus 3 is the conjugate. And I'm going to multiply the denominator as well. Now, I hope you trust me when I say don't multiply the denominator out, only the numerator. Just leave both pieces there because essentially you want h to cancel. So if you distribute the h, later you're going to have to factor it back out. Your goal is to get rid of the h, all right? And you don't see it yet, but you will very soon. All right, so again, I'm doing an algebra trick in order to get things to reduce so I can plug a zero into this thing. The idea of multiplying by the conjugate means the inside and outside terms will cancel when I FOIL it. So all I have to do is multiply first by first, which is 9 plus h, and last plus, plus la, or last times last, which is minus 9, over h times square root of 9 plus h plus 3. Again, only FOIL the numerator, leave the denominator. We'll see why in a minute. Here the 9's cancel with each other. So I have the limit as h approaches 0 of h over h times the square root of 9 plus h plus 3. The h's, see you later dude, they cancel. What's left in the numerator right now? 1. So essentially what I did I multiplied by the conjugate and I put a square root in the denominator, which is so backwards from what you're used to. But now that the h is gone, watch what happens. I have 1 over the square root of 9 plus 3, which is 1 over 3 plus 3, or 1 6. You can get an answer when you multiply by the conjugate and put a square root in the denominator, all because it made that h. So kind of a crazy thought. That's probably one of the hardest times you're going to have because it's not ingrained in you to put a square root in the denominator. We've done the exact opposite all these years. But we got you used to at least the idea that you have something called a conjugate. Okay. Questions on that one? That you will find is one of your more difficult ones for you. Cubing. Do you remember Pascal that we talked about the other day? Teacher, please pardon the All right. Do you remember Pascal? Let's maybe, if we have to cube something, anytime you see that you need to cube something, it is in your best interest to think of your buddy Pascal here. Draw a quick Pascal's triangle. Everybody remembers what we talked about with that, how to, how to draw it, right? Everybody knows what I'm doing, right? It has the ones diagonally on the outsides. I need to go down, since it's cubed here, to the third row, which is this row here. Remember, he starts with row 0, 1, 2, 3, okay? X plus H cubed. Again, this is a problem, child. You know, you go to plug the 0 in for the H, and it, you know, it, you can't divide by 0. So I've got to do some kind of algebraic thing to it, which in this case is cubing it. So to cube x plus h, I t yo, Pascal, give me your third row. One, three, three, one, he says. And then I take whatever's the first term to the highest power, x cubed, x squared, x, and then no x at all. And then the h is in the last spot, so it's going to go over here to the highest power. And then knock it down by 1 as I go to the left until I have none. And when it's a plus sign, I get all plus signs. So there is my numerator. Your alternative to that is writing out x plus h times x plus h times x plus h. And four lines of work later, you'll have your answer. Okay, so I highly suggest you say Pascal. From here, it looks very similar to the one with the squared. Your cubes are going to cancel here on either end. Your x cubes, I should say. Everything that's left, notice it has an h. It has other stuff too, but I don't need to 
you know, factor anything else. Oops, that should be an H squared. That should be an H. Did I get them all? Okay, divided by H. And then you can see the H reduce. So again, algebraic steps are sometimes needed to simplify these things so that then you can go ahead and plug the number in. Now when I plug the zero in, I get 3x squared plus 0 plus 0, which is 3x squared. Can't do derivatives till we know limits, because limits and derivatives are buddy states. They're the same. You just get to learn some shortcuts that give you a whole bunch of time. Questions on that one? Questions on Pascal? So if you had one to the fourth power, would you be able to do it? Right? Just add a row to Pascal, right? It takes seconds to just draw that thing out real quick. Or you might just quickly, like, I don't draw it out. I just go 1 through 3, 1. Like, I know 1 through 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1, 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. Like, I know those because I've used them enough. So eventually you'll just know them. Especially one through three one. That's the most confident. You're confident. Okay. Some limits are best calculated by first finding the left hand and right hand limits. Maybe a limit, it maybe it's undefined at, at that particular point. So it's one of those where it comes to like an open circle. The following theorem says that a two-sided limit exists if and only if both the one-sided limits exist. And are equal to each other. So we did talk about that last Thursday. That the limit from this side equals L, the limit of this side equals L, and that means the limit at that point right there is L. But if they went to one went to one and the other went to two, the limit didn't exist. And so that's just repeating the same thing that we've already had. This here, you already have in your notes if you flip back to the last section. The limit as X approaches A of F of X is L if and only if. The limit as it approaches the left side is L, and the limit as it approaches the right side is L. Remember that? Right? That was everything we looked at. When computing one-sided limits, we use the fact that limit laws also hold for one-sided limits. So you can still use the power rule. You can still use the product rule, the quotient rule, the sum rule, you know, all of that. The next two theorems give two additional properties of limits. It says if f of x is less than or equal to g of x, what does that mean? Okay, if you have a graph, and here is one of your graphs, and here is the other one of your graph, so we have f of x and g of x, do you see right here how it, from here to here, f of x, if this one's f of x and this one's g of x, how f of x is greater than g of x, but you see over here how g of x is greater than f of x. So when they use these words or these symbols less than or greater than, it's just saying where one is above the other or below the other, okay, to give you a mental picture of what it's talking about. It makes it a lot easier to comprehend it. So this one's saying f of x is below g of x. So they're talking about either over here or over here, where the purple is below the green, okay, with that particular picture. When A is near uh, A, except possibly at A, and the limits of F and G both exist at X as X approaches A, then the limit of F of X is also going to be smaller than the limit as X approaches G. Well, yeah, that's because the one is higher than the other, and it's always going to be. So the limit is going to be higher as well. So it's saying if you have a situation where one function is below another, then the limit of the one that's below is going to be less than the limit of the one that's above. Again, of course it's going to be, because physicality, they're in different locations. And then we have something called the squeeze theorem. And I will tell you, the squeeze theorem has another name as well. It is called the sandwich theorem as well. Okay. Your textbook calls it the squeeze theorem. My AP textbook calls it both sandwich and squeeze. But I don't want to teach you just one name because 
who knows when you take Calc 2 what textbook you're working out of. It has both names. Okay? Think of something being squeezed between two things or sandwiched between two things. They kind of have the same, you know, meaning. If you have a function in between two other functions, it's sandwiched in there or it's squeezed in between them. Okay? That's where the name is coming from. When x is near a except possibly at a, then... Oh, and the limit of f of x equals the limit of h of x, which is L, then the limit of g of x is also going to be L. So if you have the limit of this guy over here is 2, and the limit of this guy is 2, and the other guy's in between them, sandwiched in between them, doesn't it have to be 2? But if the limit of this one's 2 and the limit of this one's 3, the one in the middle is somewhere between 2 and 3. We don't exactly know what it is. We just know that it's between 2 and 3. But this one here is specifically stating, if these two are the same number, then the guy in the middle is going to be that number 2. As well. I don't mean the number 2. But, you know. The squeeze theorem, which is sometimes called, the, there they have it, the sandwich theorem, or the pinching theorem. I personally have never heard it called the pinching theorem until this textbook so not as common, um, is illustrated in this figure. It says that if g of x is squeezed between f of x and h of x near a, and if f and h have the same limit, both the blue one is approaching that y, or that y value of l and the green one is as well, and the red one is in between them, then its limit also has to be l. One that's a cool one to show you, which I don't have calculator open today. Maybe I'll show you tomorrow. It is x squared sine x. We'll do that one tomorrow, okay? Because it's a kind of a cool one to see. Um, I'm going to, like, finish up this lesson today, but I'm just going to finish in time. So before I give you a work day tomorrow, we're going to do one problem together, okay? But I don't, I don't think I have it here. I just know it's a good one. So here it says, illustrate by graphing the functions f, g, and h in the notation of the squeeze theorem on the same screen. If 2x is less than or equal to g of x is less than or equal to x to the fourth minus x squared plus 2 for all x, evaluate the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x. Okay, so let me pull up the calculator. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go to y equals. Anything I have in there, I'm going to clear. I'm going to turn the plot off, you know, anything you might have from before. I'm going to graph 2x, and I'm going to graph x to the fourth, and then minus x squared, and then plus 2. And g of x, we don't have an equation for. Okay, we just know it's in between these. I'm going to go to Zoom Standard because I have no idea what my calculator was doing last. So there's the line, and then here is the other. Now they're asking at x equals 1. Do you see how they're touching right there? So they're the same value at x equals 1? Whatever it is at x equals 1, which I could go second calculate, plug in the value of 1, press Enter, and it tells me what it is. Now, did I need a graph to really show me that? Couldn't I have just said the limit as x approaches 1 of 2x, the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x, the limit as x approaches 1 of x to the 4th minus x squared plus 2. And then from there, I could have taken and plugged the 1 in, got a 2, plugged the 1 in over here, and gotten 1 minus 1 plus 2, which is 2. So since they're the same on the outside, the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x is 2. Okay, so this is algebraically using your limit laws, and this is 
seeing it in the picture that it's being squeezed between them. Okay, I have five minutes left. I can squeeze that other question in here. The question talks about the limit as x approaches mm -hmm. zero of x squared sine x. Okay. Sometimes they say, here it is. Can you use the squeeze theorem to show what it's between? Okay. And what it falls between is x squared. Oh, sorry. Negative x squared and positive x squared. Let me show you on the, the graph here. If I go to y equals and I type in negative x squared, and then for my next one I type in x squared sine of x, and then in the next one, I type in positive x squared. I hope I'm remembering the correct function to do this one. There's one. Here's the other. Here's the other. See how it's squeezed between them? Like if I make my picture like larger, let me go negative 100 to positive 100 by tens. And then I go negative 100, just to give us a bigger picture by tens. You'll be able to hopefully see a little bit of math. <laughs> it's squeezing in between there, though. So this is coming back down, and it keeps bouncing off of. And then there's the other one bouncing off of again, you know, that graph right there. So what you start to learn is that any time you have a power times a trig function, that it's bouncing in between. So it's kind of cool. Kind of cool. It's sandwiched in between them. All right, that finishes up section 2.3. That means tomorrow is a work day. All right, so make sure you bring your Chromebooks or your book, one or the other, so you have the problems available.